Well, that comes in the Army. I was from Utah. Nobody ever heard of anybody from Utah. I have mail call out in the street, and they holler out Utah, and I'm the guy who says, here, sir. So the name, you know, 60, it's like calling somebody Tex, if they're from Texas, or calling them Louise, if they're from Louisiana, maybe, I don't know. Uh, so that the name just stuck. The, the U Utah, I've always been known as U Utah Phillips, and that comes, I guess I can say that now, that's been a, a closely held secret for years. The, when, I, when I was uh, in Utah there, first learning the kind of music I love, my favorite singer was T. Texas Tyler. So my friend Norman Ritchie, the traveling teenage sage, started calling me U Utah Phillips. There you go. So we're here with you, Utah Phillips, and wars have defined so much. History books define times by war, but resistance is also there, and that's what often goes unchronicled, except with people like you, who have been chronicling the resistance movements for a long time. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of the people who you feel have made important differences um, in activism, in resisting the wars? Well, for that, <clears throat> I would have to go back to Union Brothers and Sisters. I would have to go back to the Espionage Act and the First World War. Um, I, in my union, the Industrial Workers of the World, this is my 50th year in the IWW, by the way, uh, my proudest association. It is the only organization I've ever been ever known of that didn't break faith with its elders. Well, when I hit the road, when I went out to try to find out who I really was to reconstruct my life, uh, when I left Utah, I found those elders and I sought them out. I never thought I would be able to say this, Amy, but my, most of my elders, most of my great teachers were born the century before last. <laughs> that I was born in the 1890s. And I think of Fred Thompson and, and the, the, the elders that I've talked to that went through the First World War as, as Unionists and endured the Espionage Act, endured the, the, the enormous persecution, um, and just kept at it and kept at it. That was an amazing thing because that was the, 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 one, of the, one of the effects of the war, uh, and the same thing happened in the Second World War, was to use that super patriotism and to use the, the enhanced governmental powers to break the back of the labor movement especially the radical labor movement, the IWW, and, and pretty damn well, you know, near succeeded. In spite of that, you know, of that terrible oppression and, and that, that awful war, we came out of that war with the, 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 sh the beginning of the eight-hour day with mine safety laws, with child labor laws, you know. We were still winning all the time we were losing. For young people who've never heard of the Wobblies or the mm. International Workers of the World, industrial can you explain workers of the world, I industrial workers of the world, can you explain its origins? Industrial workers of the world was started, grew out of the Western Federation of Miners. It started in 1905. the The cornerstone of the, the of the IWW was the notion that people in the same industry should belong to the same union. Big Bill Haywood there in, in, uh, in Colorado. Big Bill's a true American. Uh, he, he was one of the founders of the IWW. Um, he, his father rode for the Pony Express. His mother was a 49er who got off the wagon train in Salt Lake. Bill was born in Salt Lake. There in Colorado, he'd see how a mine would get struck. So they'd bring in scabs to bring out scab ore, and then it would be transported to the mill on the Union train and milled at the Union mill. He said, all of the people in this industry should belong to one union, because that's union scabbing. So um, industrial unionism was born as an alternative to the craft unionism, uh, like the AFL, organized bodies of workers fighting against each other. And it wasn't just industrial unionism. It was the one big union, the OBU, a union of all skilled, semi-skilled, and unskilled workers in one big union, divided up into industrial departments, syndicalist, syndicalism, which would then replace the government the means of production in the hands of the producers, produce for use instead of profit, create abundance for workers and nothing for parasites. An end to the wage system. Well, like John Greenway he called the IWW a Banzai charge on capitalism, and that was about right. Well, of course, the union dwindled, you know, after the, after the First World War, the Palmer raids, which were so much worse than anything we're experiencing now. Um, 
but still survived. And now the union is growing, has been growing for quite a long time now. The Palmer Raids? No, the, the, the industrial work. Right, the world, but the Palmer you know. Raids, yeah. if you could say what they were, again, for people who... Oh, Attorney General Palmer, um, that was the first Red Scare, the first big Red Scare. The, the Russian Revolution had been accomplished uh, right at the, you know, during the First World War. So the first big Red Scare happened when Attorney General Palmer um, caused thousands of unionists to be jailed and many, many pe uh, immigrant workers to be deported without any kind of due process. And um, it was uh, like an industrial war. And, and uh, Palmer, they did their best to break up the IWW and it never succeeded because we have survived and we have persisted. You talk about the Palmer Raids. You talk about the Espionage Act. How do you think the time we're living in now compares? I think that I think that it's getting it. It can get as it can get as bad. I think that we're being frog marched into a, a corporate fascist takeover of the country, um, and no fooling. I think that we're in the Weimar. Republic, and that's another thing that I would encourage young people to understand. What that that was Germany before the Second World War, the rise of Hitler, the rise of Nazism. What? Why didn't people do anything? Uh, that you know, the big question that young Germans are asking their grandparents: Why didn't you do something? Read about the Weimar. Compare the rise of fascism uh, in Germany from the 1920s to what's happening right here, right now. Um, the, the long memory is the most radical idea in America. That long memory has been taken away from us. Listen, you young people don't talk to you, that, that long memory has been taken away from you. You haven't gotten it in your schools, you're not getting it on your television, you're not getting it anywhere. You're being leapfrogged from one crisis to the next, you know. You can't remember what happened last week because you're locked into this week's crisis. No. Turn that off, you know, walk away from that, walk out your front door, go find your elders, go find your two elders, go find your people that, that lived that life, who, who knew that life, and who know that history, and, and get your hands down into that deep, rich stream of our people's history. We, we're, we're, we divided our culture up into a market for youngers, a market for young adults, a market for young marries, a market for, for older people, you know. Um, it's not that way. The, 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 and, and mass media contributed that by, by taking the great movements that we've been through and, and tri trivializing important events. Um, no, our people's history is like one long river. It, it flows down from way over there, and everything that those people did and everything they lived flows down to me, and I can reach down and take out what I need if I have the courage to go out and ask questions. Um, that, that, <laughs> that huge river, you know, that, that it's like tributaries that flow down into the polluted river and, and purify it, you know, purify it.